And thanks again, Minister Tang. Uh, it's a real pleasure and a real honor to be able to sit here and uh, hopefully have a really strong, uh, you know, deep discussion and great conversation with you. Uh, this whole thing was actually set up like um, where it's supposed to be a conversation. I share some of my stories, you share some of your stories. But the more I did research on you, the more I feel like I would like to take a little bit more of a back seat and kind of like really highlight and spotlight you and your stories and your journey. And here and there, I'll just augment a little bit. Um, and I also want to be able to share a little bit of my perspective in, uh, in terms of the research that I've done. I mean, like just, you know, watching your videos, reading articles about you. Um, I, I wanted to just like do a very quick intro about myself. This is largely an internal video for, for us, but uh, I want to be able to spoon feed the audience as well, like my perspective of you and all, like my favorite discoveries about you as part of the intro. And then I'll pause, I'll let you, you know, flesh that out even more. Um, and then I'll jump into like my first question as, as Michael suggested. Uh, if you don't mind, if that flow sounds good to you, uh, I would. Uh, I think it'll be. I think it'll be great. Thank you. Any anything on your side? Would you any thoughts? Any preference you have in how this will go, or how this should go? Mm, well, uh, first of all, I thank you for your consent for this to be a not internal only uh, conversation, uh, where I'll publish uh, my side of video, but uh, your side of audio as well uh, to the Creative Commons attribution. Uh, because I do believe uh, that this is uh, more than just a uh, dialogue. I think this is a beginning uh, for people to have a wider understanding and appreciation uh, of the areas of common interest, uh, namely the Pride uh, and the LGBTIQA plus community's um, current take uh, on not just the uh, geopolitical and the technical, but also like socially, how we form solidarity across uh, jurisdictions. So uh, I hope that with the kind of public um, launch, right, the Creative Commons attribution of this video, uh, I look forward to more remixing and more conversations uh, based on the topics that we explore today. Uh, totally uh, unrelated uh, perspectives may be emerge. For example, I had a very serious interview about um, like digital democracy and so on, but there was a rap band in Japan called Dos Monos that just took bits and pieces from that interview and remix into a hit mm. uh, rap song, right, a hip hop song. Uh, and right. that brought the conversation into a very different um, perspective, a very different audience. Now, there's no guarantee that our conversation will be made into a hip hop song, but, uh, you know, maybe some other <laughs> art forms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. hopefully if they do make a hip hop song, they use your parts and not mine. So, uh, yep, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Karen, I think you could be a really good rap star. <laughs> I know. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I don't have anything else. So I'm ready whenever. Okay. Maybe we'll, we'll give this a go. We'll see how this goes. And then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. like we, this is all a recording. Yeah, we can always pause and retake. Mm -hmm. yeah? Great. Just give me like a few seconds. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen is I'll count down uh, from five. Karen, you just start with your intro. And okay. then just uh, what we like to do is we normally have the conversation uh, be as natural as possible. We just let it flow. Um, if there's any yeah. additional um, <coughs> questions or uh, things that we want to talk about, we can uh, do it at the end. But otherwise, we'll just let the conversation be... Just let it flow as naturally as possible. <laughs> Can do. Can do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. My hair is not as obedient <laughs> as <laughs> It always likes to stand mm -hmm. up on its own. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's, it's very independent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, independent. Minister Tang, are you, are you in Taiwan today? I, I noticed mm -hmm. you were traveling recently. Yeah, uh, I'm my my jet lagged brain uh, is in Italy, but physically I'm in Taipei. Uh, I'm the second day uh, of my uh, quarantine upon return. Oh dear! Nice Thank you for How making time for this. Quarantine? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I, I'm I'm the days? last batch to do seven days. Everyone else uh, after this week do three days. 
Ah, mm. and when can visitors come? Because I'm dying to go to Taiwan. If you're okay with three days, you can you can come like right now. If you want ah. to do zero days, okay. maybe I don't know August. Ah, okay, great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I'll, co I'll come drop in your, your, maybe your weekly chat. Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Social I... Innovation Lab, that's right. Yes. yes. Cool. Uh -huh. Okay, are we, we ready? Mm -hmm. yep. Can we roll TDR and can we roll the cam in the <clears throat> studio? Thank you. Uh, Michael, I'm just going to keep you silent. Um, yep. At the point where we cut, uh, I will uh, unmute you. Let me just switch over to Karen's solo frame first. Okay. Uh, Karen, ready? Let's go for the yeah. first take. Don't worry if we need to retake, just take a pause and then we start from the, uh, where we, uh, maybe the top of the paragraph. Okay, I'll do a quick introduction about myself. Let's just a very quick, like two lines and then I'll go into the, the bit about uh, uh, Minister Tang. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, also, feel perfect. free to just call me Audrey. <coughs> there, there's okay. no need for the right honorable and everything. So just Audrey is fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, ready? Let's go for the first take. In five, four, three, two, one. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Teo, and as you know, I head up the Global Business Group uh, with the Scaled Team and the Global Co-Exec Sponsor for Pride Act. I am very excited to be here today to talk to Minister Audrey Tang. Now, it takes very little to find out a lot about Minister Tang online. I've taken the liberty to put together a few of my favorite discoveries of Audrey. But let me start with pertinent information first. Audrey Tang, if you didn't know, is the Digital Minister of Taiwan the first digital minister, and as the first and youngest digital minister of Taiwan at age 35, Audrey wrote the JD for that position in the form of a poem to make it relatable and to make it understandable for the general public. Audrey is probably one of most articulate and fun speakers to listen to in the space of public policy, governance, and tech for all. In my research, I found that my favorite strategies of Audrey so far is, number one, humor over ru rumor during the pandemic, to combat both misinformation and the management of the virus, um, and Gov Zero, a social innovation initiative to drive gov government tech improvements. I'm sure we'll hear more from Audrey uh, as we continue talking to her. Not surprising, Audrey, that you've made the list of top 100 global thinkers in 2019. All in all, in my research and observation, Audrey and Audrey's intellect is full of fun surprises, and I look forward to learning more about the person behind all this impact, in, all this impact and intellect. Audrey, over to you. Hello, Karen, uh, and really happy uh, to be part of Pride Connects Us. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm really happy to share uh, my personal journey leading up uh, to the moment. Um, one of my most formative moments uh, occurred when I was four years old, one of my earliest memories. You see, I was born with a, a heart defect, uh, and I overheard uh, the surgeons, my doctors, telling my parents uh, that this kid, that's me, uh, have to live to, I don't know, how many years old uh, in order to get the heart surgery uh, that I need, uh, but the chance, uh, or so the doctor estimates, is just 50-50. Now, uh, since that's my formative memory, uh, I spent the next uh, eight years until I actually got a heart surgery when I was 12 um, in a kind of Schrodinger's box. Uh, that is to say, going to sleep every night without knowing whether I can wake up or not. And that uh, accrued in me a very different uh, world perspective. Basically, uh, I'm motivated to publish uh, before I perish. Uh, still to this day, uh, I check every night 
um, before I go to sleep, whether I've already published uh, everything I can into Creative Commons uh, for the video recordings and interviews like this one. I ask everything to be in the Commons uh, right away instead of having to wait for 70 or 80 years after I pass away and so on, because I understand there really is nothing to hold uh, and there is everything to share. So I'm sure that my commitment to radical transparency, free software, civic participation, and so on, all flew uh, from this very simple idea that uh, someone else uh, can continue and I'm just a vehicle of the kind of very transient vehicle uh, of the knowledge, of the fun, of the social solidarity, uh, and so on. It's not about uh, me hoarding anything, but rather me about me sharing uh, what I have to share. So looking forward to today's sharing. Wow. Yes, I'm sure we will hear a lot from you and uh, a lot of your thoughts and, and, and sharing. And I, I, I agree, you basically embody the whole sense of living every day like it's your last. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that many of us fail to do for ourselves and for society. But thanks for that reminder. And um, it's definitely given me a different insight uh, into you and, and, the, and the way you're, you're, you are today. So that's helpful. But let me start, since we are talking about how uh, you went, what you went through as a child, let me keep us in that early part of your mm -hmm. life. Um, many of us, right, in our pride uh, community at Meta, re really want to know even more about you. I read that you left school at 14, mm -hmm. and then you started your own company in the Silicon Valley a few years later, and then you didn't look back. So beyond the age of 12, tell us more about mm -hmm. your youth and how it led to who and where you are today. Mm -hmm. Anyone who inspired you when, mm -hmm. we, when you were young and how did they do that? Sorry, that was three questions in one, mm -hmm. but sure. I want to pack as many mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah, I attended three kindergartens, uh, six primary schools, uh, and just one year of middle school before dropping out. So that's 10 schools for 10 years. I've never uh, had a chance to do uh, what we call a uh, summer uh, work, right? Because uh, I'm always switching schools in the summer. So uh, I think this uh, instilled in me a very different pattern, uh, a different social pattern, in that the physical uh, seems to be very transient, impermanent for me, uh, but the virtual uh, is actually more real than real. One of my earliest uh, moments is encountering uh, the idea of programming when I was eight years old. Uh, I think it was because two of my uncles uh, worked in information industry, one in Acer Computer, one in the Institute of Information Industry in Taiwan, and they have uh, in our bookshelf uh, lots of programming books. Now, uh, I learned about programming languages. Uh, I think it was first logo and then basic, uh, and then I didn't have a personal computer. That was 1989, so I just drew uh, on paper uh, using a pen to draw a keyboard and a pencil uh, to draw the cursor, and every day I wake up and erase uh, that pencil mark and type in, I think, randomized time uh, CLS or something, uh, and then uh, just erase uh, the, the pencil. And I think this uh, taught me really computational thinking and uh, programming as a form of a instrument uh, even before uh, my parents uh, finally uh, gave in and I just got me some personal computer um, hours afterwards, right? So uh, this really showed uh, to me that um, the computing uh, as a way of thinking is independent of any particular hardware and it is just a way to kind of outsource uh, part of the thinking part of our brain, the automatic part, uh, into the machines, and then we can uh, focus on the creative and co-creative parts. Now, after I got a personal computer, it became my hobby uh, to play some of the educational games uh, available in the demos in the Guanghua market, uh, but I didn't purchase any of those uh, commercial software. Rather, I just play it uh, when I visit, and then I go back and reverse engineer, or uh, not really, uh, clean room implement uh, the games. So I, I made a lot of interactive games, and those to entertain myself, but also to just uh, show my um, cousins, my brother, uh, and so on, uh, how it is possible book to learn about very advanced mathematical concepts uh, in a very gradual way uh, with a tireless um, teacher. That is to say, the computer program um, 
explain the role of a kind of ambient um, teacher. So uh, pedagogy has always been uh, my inspiration when I think of uh, computer programming and social applications. Oh, that's uh, for a young child, like in th mm -hmm. that thinking is, is fascinating. You know, most kids I know, right? They, they, they see something, they want something, and then they're like, ah, oh, I don't have it, uh, I'll do something else. But you actually mm -hmm. created your own computer on, mm -hmm. with a piece of paper, drew, and then reiterated all that. Have, when, when you did that, when you created this like uh, paper computer uh, until you finally got a computer, mm -hmm. what was going through your head? Was it, uh, were you, did you think that you were, play, you were playing and it was an imagination or were you mm -hmm. actually thinking like, this is, I'm like kind of planning for when I actually have that piece of hardware. Like what, what was going through mm -hmm. your young mind? Yeah, uh, at probably the same time uh, I was learning piano. Uh, but I didn't have like regular access to keyboards uh, until a while afterward. So to me, this is a lot like my piano classes <laughs> where I study uh, the very mm -hmm. abstract notes uh, and then simulate the playing, but without actually a piano. Uh, but by the time I actually got into, I think it was weekly, uh, my piano classes, uh, I get to uh, practice what I have already practiced rather silently. Uh, of course, uh, again, after a while, we've got piano in our home. Uh, but I think the, the point I'm making is that I see programming as a kind of uh, performance that has two parts. One is the abstract part, that's the notes, uh, the, and the interactive part, that's the actual melody. Uh, and the melody shapes people's interactions uh, in a way that may be pro-social or anti-social, uh, but it's the notes, the abstract part uh, that interests me uh, because I like mathematics, but I don't like math. Uh, and before I got um, computer and computer programming, I thought to uh, study advanced mathematics required during uh, um, the learning process, do a lot of math, and I really don't like that. Uh, but uh, it turns out uh, computer is really good at symbolic processing. So as long as, as soon as I get the concept right, uh, the technical part, the mechanical part can be taken care of and I get to enjoy uh, in the much more enjoyable world of mathematics, not just math that's kind Calculations. I, I think that's that's fantastic. It's like uh, even the way that you run the digital ministry at this mm -hmm. point, right? Mm -hmm. It is uh, you are owning. Like you, I've seen an interview where you say, if if your if your bandwidth, if your internet access is not strong enough, mm -hmm. that's on me. Yes. At the same time, you mm -hmm. open it up to everybody to contribute to it. Mm -hmm. What are some of the core values that has? driven you to take the taking the kind of decisions that you take and the, the choices that you make or even like the people you keep around you and the mm -hmm, way you mm -hmm. work yeah i think uh really the earliest uh, memory i have of participating in the internet uh, was reading about uh, the earlier internet documents, the internet drafts, the request for comments, uh, as it were, uh, that talks about the philosophy of the internet. I think it was 1993, I was 12 years old. Uh, and then uh, I, I remember very clearly uh, uh, Postel's uh, law uh, from John Postel uh, that says um, the, the way to build a robust uh, network in communication is to be conservative uh, in what you do, but be liberal in what you accept. Uh, it's later uh, being referred as the Postel's Law or the Robustness Principle. And I think it really had a lasting impression on me because uh, I try to apply it socially as well. Um, as you probably have heard, I've described myself as sort of a conservative in a sense that I respect the traditions. And in Taiwan, we've got 20 national languages, more than half of which indigenous, all with their um, traditions. And I don't like uh, the idea of a simple progress in one of the 20 uh, directions uh, to decimate or to set back the other 19 cultures, traditions rather. I want to uh, feel uh, that I can take all the sides, find the common uh, ground and deliver innovations that works together for everyone or at least um, that everyone can live with. And that comes from the early internet protocol philosophy of being very liberal uh, in what I accept. That's cool. It's, uh, you know, my work 
today is uh, we manage like a skilled business, which means we manage uh, businesses of all sizes. There are some really big ones and there's some like just starting. And we're also trying constantly to uh, create processes and programs so that we can add value to all of these different ones, uh, Mm -hmm. different businesses, Mm -hmm. rather than trying to just do one for just the big or the small or the mid- middle size. And I know it's difficult. It's, it's so hard. And I do think that uh, understanding this actually comes from, from a business standpoint. Um, you know, we're driven by things like cost and efficiencies uh, of resources. So it, it kind of makes sense. But from living as a human being, trying to think about how to bring, uh, create impact that, benefits everybody right all the different identities around you i think that that can somehow be more challenging i've also seen that you've talked about how your non-binary identity has allowed mm-hmm. you to see more perspectives mm-hmm. now, this one quote that i maybe you don't mind explaining more mm-hmm. uh, the quote we don't think that there's half of the world that's different from us mm-hmm. uh, i don't know whether you remember this but it, it definitely resonated can you tell us uh, explain that a little bit and tell us how the experience of living through different mm-hmm. identities allows you to see this multiple perspectives? Yeah, I, I don't see uh, that myself living through different identities. Uh, really, uh, what I've always pictured in my mind uh, is just a continuous experience. Now, when I say be liberal in what I accept, I, I don't just mean in a tolerating sense. Uh, I mean, actually, if uh, I see someone, uh, a stakeholder in a multi-stakeholder conversation, uh, talking from a place that I just totally don't comprehend, uh, so that I cannot even accept mentally uh, what they're saying. Uh, I always think it's my fault, uh, it's on me, uh, to spend some time on a ethnographic, really hanging out uh, with that group of people until I can uh, sincerely argue their case. Uh, but I wouldn't say I switched to a different identity during that. That would sound very strange, right? I would say that uh, I joined uh, in their experience uh, so that there's one more point in common uh, that I can relate to or to build empathy, right? So um, instead of saying that uh, I identify as this and then I identify as that, I usually say, oh, I had this experience when I was 20 or I had another experience when I was 25. Mm. Okay. So you very deliberately create uh, opportunity for these different experiences to in order to create that empathy and understanding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, uh, I, I don't really? have a fixed label of myself is what I'm saying. Right. Yes, I understand. I think very uh, cerebral and also very emotional desire to connect and, and, and build the empathy is, is hard. Like, do you have any advice for people to, to be able to build that, those two muscles mm-hmm. like you have? Yeah, um, I I think always start from a place of humor, uh, of fun, right? That relieves the tension and also creates memorable um, points of reference. I always like to say that uh, in April 2020, uh, when a young boy caught the toll-free number 1922 of our counter epidemic line, saying that I'm a young boy, you're raising your mask, uh, pink ones, I don't wear pink to school, all the boys in my class have navy blue masks and so on. Uh, the very next day on the daily 2 p.m. conference, all the medical officers, including the minister, Chen Shizhong, wore pink. Uh, and in Chen Shizhong, uh, the minister even said that Pink Panther uh, was his childhood hero. Uh, and so the boy became the most hit boy. All the fashion brands turned pink for a couple of weeks after that. And I think <laughs> Minister Chen you know, became a little bit more transgender, right? <laughs> just that uh, moment, just that <laughs> 2 p.m. Uh, and it's not a, a huge thing, right? It's not like he, he like thoroughly cross-dressed or something, uh, but like him wearing the pink mask, saying Pink Panther, my childhood hero, uh, really cements a cultural moment uh, in the Taiwanese uh, population. And that allowed us uh, to then see mask as something that is a point of pride. It's not a point of o- obeying something, of compliance, of state power, uh, state capacity, right? Rather, it became a symbol of civic capacity and self-expression. So I made a point of wearing rainbow mask for quite a while after that. Oh, 
Thank you. That's awesome. That's a, such a great story. Um, and look, I obviously, all the stories that you've shared so far shows how important it is to have empathy, right? And in the work that you do and the work of like any public servant or even someone in tech mm -hmm. uh, as well with you. How do you think, um, and that's why I asked for your, your advice, how do you think uh, your own lived experience has been an asset to developing empathy and, and, and developing it constantly? Any, yeah. mm -hmm. any thoughts there? Yeah, um, two, two broad uh, brushes of thoughts. Uh, one is that I'm non-binary, not just in gender, uh, but rather in, in everything. Right, so uh, people know when I become digital minister in 2016 that I not just uh, wrote who are not applicable uh, to the gender field in the HR form, but I also wrote the same word uh, not applicable to the party affiliation uh, wor world. Right, so people do not see me as uh, part of the ruling party, part of the opposition party, or things like that. I'm like you know, no matter which party you have, um, I'm happy uh, to stand by you and argue uh, from your point of view to take all the sides uh, as it were. Uh, of course, I would uh, officially endorse a party uh, later on uh, called Can't Stop This Party, uh, which is a, a joke party uh, created by YouTubers uh, for pedagogical purposes. Uh, it disbanded a year afterward, right? But again, that puts the, the humor, uh, the shared experience point of reference uh, that dissolves a lot of tensions toward party uh, polarization into, uh, from outrage into co-creation. So that's the first thing. It's about being non-binary in, in everything, right? Uh, the second uh, about building empathy uh, is simply that uh, people um, can be trollish, uh, especially on um, some antisocial uh, social media that we both know. Uh, like uh, people can very easily start flame wars and, and so on. Uh, and I develop a habit of what I call troll hugging. Uh, basically, I would um, look for like personal attacks toward me uh, and. On Facebook in particular, uh, in the mobile interface, there's this latest uh, search API that very easily let me see uh, what uh, latest uh, personal interactions that people have uh, mm -hmm. toward me. Uh, so I can see uh, basically uh, everything that mentions me, um, like in three different languages, my name. Uh, and then if there's, of course, something constructive, I uh, reply and we do co-creation uh, right there. Uh, but even when there's like pretty mm, toxic personal attacks, uh, instead of just reporting it, uh, I would uh, look at those 100 words, uh, see maybe four or five words in which that can be construed as constructive. Uh, and then I just ignore everything else. Um, and then just focus on the four or five things that can be taken a little bit out of context to mean something authentic, something sincere. And then I just reply either direct message or publicly uh, and add that person as a friend. Uh, and then we start to develop uh, this um, camaraderie, right? Uh, it's both pedagogical in showing everyone that it's only the constructive part that get any attention at all, but also it's genuinely like hugging a troll. Uh, people troll mostly because they feel a kind of frustration that their gripes are not being addressed uh, by the powers that be, right? But when I uh, just focus my attention on the part that are authentic, they become very willing to share authentic experiences, and many of them actually visit the Social Innovation Lab, and we become pretty good acquaintances. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty amazing. I I I don't think it's in our in our guidelines. Like you know, if you're trolled online, like what you do is try hug the troll. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's but that's brilliant. That's uh, that's a really interesting interesting way of uh, addressing uh, people who may not be on the same page as you or are really just there trying to like you know yank your chain a little bit mm -hmm. um from like look trolling online wise uh people sometimes view trolling as bullying as well um other than in the online space like i, I mean look for me growing up like bullying you know in its many different forms has has taken place before i was never like the most I was never like the most popular person in school or the most beautiful or like the 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 fastest, strongest, etc. So, you know, you've got, uh, I've experienced bullying to some extent. What about you? Like, I mean, just this trolling thing just makes me wonder, like, how did you deal with, uh, if you have, mm -hmm. how did you deal with bullies uh, in your past? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so uh, I think right after I discovered personal computers when I was eight years old, I uh, did get some bullying at school. Uh, and that was mm, the time when I think uh, I'm in the you know gifted class when I was uh, on the second grade and the person that placed the second uh, in the ranks uh, in terms of written exams and so on uh, always bullied me uh, sometimes quite viciously uh, because um, and I quote um, that uh, if I had died uh, then uh, he would be the first place end of quote uh, so this is a, a pretty intense uh, individual to individual competition uh, going on. Uh, so I did actually uh, quit school for a, a couple months on the second semester uh, when I was eight. And uh, so he actually became the first in class, although in absolute terms that really didn't do him any good, but uh, relatively uh, did um, you know, improve uh, his standing in family. Uh, but in uh, all honesty, I, I didn't focus on kind of revenge or anything. I spent most of my time reading books uh, from Satya, from Piaget, from Montessori, um, and so on, uh, to learn about child psychology, to learn about how the social, structural, uh, individual to individual competition, and how it shapes uh, a young person's uh, mind. Because in my mind, if I uh, retaliate or if I try to, you know, out um, him as the bully, uh, that doesn't solve the structural issue um, because I may pass away any day, right? Uh, then the next class, right, uh, one year younger, um, the same structure may be because this is, after all, not about the bully or the bully. The, this is about the um, educational culture at a time in Taiwan. So after I figured that out and decided that the only way to uh, resolve this is to get the young children, each one their own PBL, uh, purpose or project-based uh, learning, so that everyone can be the first uh, in their end of us. So that's when I uh, became really interested in um, pedagogy, in educational theory, uh, which would also affect my work uh, later on to actually uh, reshape uh, the curriculum of Taiwan uh, circa 2015-16 so that actually the, this current generation of children do not suffer from the same institutional um, structural abuse uh, that I used to suffer. Wow. I mean, how, 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 what are the results like today? Like, do mm -hmm. you, are you yeah, happy it's much better, it, yes. Uh, how that changed? Your yes, definitely. Uh, Taiwan now is the most vibrant in Asia in terms of alternative experimental education. Up to 10% of schools uh, can be, you know, schools uh, uh, in a very liberal sense, like homeschool or group school, institutional school that's not following the right. curriculum. But at the same time, even for institutional basic education, we've incorporated the same idea of autonomous interaction to a common good uh, so that people who are eight years old now uh, do get to choose their own directions and become much more liberal, I guess, uh, in what they accept. And there's uh, far less individual to individual competitions now, which is a drastic change, actually, from our previous uh, East Asian uh, written exam cram uh, based uh, education way. So I think if I had not uh, myself experienced that sort of bullying, I would not be able to contribute uh, meaningfully to the education reforms. I'm very thankful. Unbelievable that unbelievable that you even as a young person as a young child you mm -hmm. the instinct is not to fight the instinct mm -hmm. is to like okay let me go and read about this mm -hmm. and then let me figure out how to fix this structural uh, problem it's uh, I I I really don't think that um, anyone else out there works like you thinks like mm -hmm. you functions like you uh, in fact everybody's kind of Everyone feels that they are flawed to some mm -hmm. extent, right? And 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 uh, when and I'm sure you with your all your broad reading and and in psychology and 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 understanding of people, mm -hmm. some of the one of the biggest things that drives um, behavior or harm to oneself or to society or to someone else is this sense of um, uh, insecurity or, or like pain, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you think? especially in the LGBTQI community, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of that. Right? This inability to like embrace oneself mm -hmm. um, and like to, to call what's authentic. What is your advice for the community mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, a, in, mm -hmm. a, in, in this situation in a space like this? 
Yeah, but uh, I, I think the safe space uh, that I found uh, in first computer programming and then in the internet society, the internet culture, uh, really is the, the anchor uh, that kept me first sane and then uh, later on productive. Uh, right, because as I mentioned, uh, the surrounding environment changes literally every year. I do not have a good uh, social anchor uh, on which to build uh, my security right uh, profile, right, my psychological security profile. Uh, but rather uh, because I understand that online, if I publish uh, anything, it doesn't go away. Uh, even if I move to a very different city afterward, as long as I remember my passwords, I can always just log in uh, back to my internet accounts and then uh, follow on the same mailing list and so on. Actually, if I don't say I'm just uh, 14 years old, most of the researchers I work with at that time uh, just assume I'm a fellow PhD student or something. So uh, really, there's uh, almost no discrimination uh, on the early internet because people were at that time discovering this new thing called the Wild Web called the preprint server and so on, they're far more interested in actually publishing and doing something together uh, than discriminating uh, against each other. So I think I was uh, blessed to engage the early 90s internet culture at that point in life so that I can feel anchored uh, in the safe space. Now, of course, uh, we've seen LGBTIQA plus communities anchoring themselves on the internet forums, uh, even on the shared realities, um, the, the uh, so-called uh, metaverse right, uh, that people enjoy together. But uh, I think even in the text-based only way that I experienced in the early 90s, this speaks to the same spirit of a safe space independent of the social relationship in the analog world. What do you think we can do? Um, as you know, Meta uh, wants is very invested in being one of the many companies out there in building for the metaverse. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we talked about uh, incessantly is about making sure that we build access for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. For community. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is, I, I'm just wondering, as LGBTQI A plus um, mm -hmm. uh, people, um, how do we play a part in building the metaverse in the future so that can continue to be a place of diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion. Yeah, I think it, it's at the end of the day just to empower people closest to the pain so they can shape their own social norms. Uh, my earliest uh, social VR experience was in high fidelity. I was uh, in Paris and talking to a bunch of uh, middle school and high school um, students uh, in Taiwan. And we're all just wearing these HTC Vive thing uh, in, in this metaverse. But uh, my avatar is deliberately shaped uh, to be the same height as the young children. So they don't have to look up to me, <laughs> but rather can relate to me uh, in the kind of playground uh, that we commonly share. And it's very important that it's just me and them uh, and uh, our surroundings that get to decide the interaction rules, uh, which may or may not make sense to anybody else. Right. So uh, just like um, hosting and recording a podcast and listening to a podcast uh, can be on very different platforms and it's all decided uh, by the people who have uh, something to say and something to listen. This end-to-end -end innovation principle, I think, is very important uh, going forward. Now, I'm not pretending that Metaverse can be solved uh, by a simple protocol called RSS or ITEM, right, that I <laughs> worked on that enabled the podcast uh, ecosystem. But we need to remember uh, that the internet was shaped like this, that end-to-end uh, -end innovation really uh, makes sense only when uh, the persons in the safe space are the only ones uh, that has the final say about rules and interactions. That makes sense. Um, idealistic uh, makes a lot of sense and hopefully we all can embrace that and you know build that future where we can continue to have that, that diversity and inclusion in, in that space. Um, I also want to uh, call out something that I, I read an article recently about you and you were quoting uh, Anthem, the mm -hmm. Leonard Cohen uh, song. And the lyric is like, it's a really very beautiful song, uh, the way it's written, the poetry almost. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. Uh, do you mind telling us more uh, about what this mm -hmm. speaks to perhaps, uh, in your opinion, to people in our families, our communities and our companies? 
Mm-hmm. And I think uh, also many in Taiwan and around the world mm-hmm. too. Yeah, uh, right. The uh, verse that goes before that was uh, ring the bells that still can ring and forget your perfect offering. Uh, and then there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. Um, that was the verse that cured me of perfectionism. I used to be very perfectionist. Uh, I don't want to uh, publish anything before I polish it, but I also am compelled to publish before I sleep. Uh, and the end result is that I publish in like very fine fragments. Um, but the problem of very fine fragments, like small haikus and poetries, um, is that really there's very little for others to do, right? <laughs> you can, I guess, retweet that but uh, or, or say like, uh, but mm-hmm. uh, if it's uh, short and uh, pretty complete, um, it's not a building block. On the other hand, uh, if I just publish a stream of consciousness that has a lot of uh, wrinkles, a lot of places that I haven't thought through, uh, it may look not perfect, uh, but it actually is the beginning of a conversation, uh, and that's how the light uh, gets in. So I encountered uh, that verse of Lena Cohen, translated that to Mandarin, and it's been my motto ever since uh, to remind myself that maybe the best way to contribute to the world is not to publish things that are perfect, but to deliberately uh, publish work in progress in a way that elicits uh, conversations, but also trolling, but that's fine, also hugging the trolling. That's uh, so aligned with how we think about you know, social innovation and social technologies uh, mm-hmm. here at Meta. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, many people around the world look to you as an inspiration uh, and as a role model. Um, I think uh, a lot of people like want to see someone who looks like them, identifies like them in a position of power and influence. How do you feel about that? And any, um, you know, last like words of advice and, and encouragement to the community at large? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, well, you, you mentioned uh, briefly my poetic job description uh, that I would like to, to recite that because really I think that's... Yes, uh, us in the technology world, it's very easy for us to focus on the technology uh, and then asking the society to adapt to technology, while, of course, all the technology that got real adoption is not the disruptive ones, uh, but rather the ones that fits the norms, empowers the local norms. So uh, my job description goes like this. Uh, when we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So, yeah, the plurality is here. That's my word of advice. Uh, We don't need to chase the singularity. We need to embrace the plurality. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much, Audrey. It was, uh, I still have like a million questions, Mm -hmm. but uh, we'll save that for another time. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really great talking to you. And and I love the whole connection, plurality Mm -hmm. piece. Thank you. Thank you.